listening to another episode of This Year in History with Voodoo Daddy Eddie. <laughs> this is Halloween special. Hi, I'm Marissa. And I am Jordan. Today, we're going to be discussing a topic from the year 1917. Like the movie, but not. The movie? The movie 1917 that took place in 1917 called 1917. Oh, the <laughs> one I called 1914. Yeah. <laughs> we're here. Oh We've made it. <laughs> All right. So what are you going to be talking about today? Not anything related to the movie 1917, but I'm going to be talking about something a little special since this is being released on Halloween. I want to do like kind of a true crime mystery type of story. And so I found one called, well, I'm going to call it the Mysterious Milwaukee Police Station Bombing of 1917. Mm. Now, when researching the story, I found various versions of it, um, which had slightly different details. So I summed it up the best way I could. So I apologize in advance if there are any historical inaccuracies. You're just going based off of what you learned. What I what I'm making my best guess of, like just tiny little details, like the times and the age of a child and stuff like that. Two people say that she was 11. One person says she's 10. I'm going to say 11. The majority rules. So, oh, okay. Well, little details yeah. like that. So if it's not completely accurate, well, you don't know because not many people know about this story. If you did, I would be able to research it better. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm limited with what stories are out there, what articles are available. I'll start with telling you about how until the attacks of 9-11-2001, the single deadliest event in national law enforcement history occurred on the 24th of November 1917. Oh, really? So until 9-11, this was the biggest That disaster. involved law enforcement. Exactly. Okay. So a bomb attack that killed 10 people including nine local police officers in Milwaukee in the Milwaukee Police Department. The bomb exploded inside the assembly of the Central Police Station at Broadway and Oneida Street, now known as Well Street. Now, it's still a mystery who made the bomb and who detonated it so and where it came from. even with the Oklahoma bombing in, in the 1990s? This specified... The deadliest event in national law enforcement history. Okay. Not, not disaster in yeah, the United States. Yeah, but I guess... There wasn't more than 10 law enforcement people? I guess not. I guess okay. they're mostly civilians that died in that one. Yeah. Okay. All I mean, right. Would you, would you, yeah, you would call a, uh, a cop's not a civilian, right? I guess that's the term you would use. Yeah. They're called citizens on patrol, but they're not a civilian. Yeah. Got it. So, who was the bomb intended to kill? Well, the bomb was displayed as a paper wrapped package which originally was discovered on the steps of St. Anne's Church, located in the Italian-populated Third Ward. Oh, so they didn't even send it to the precinct? No. Okay. That's why it's a big mystery. Oh, like, wow. So was it supposed to kill somebody in the church? I was just about to Okay, get I'm to sorry. That. <laughs> it's a mystery who it's supposed to kill. But, uh, yeah, well, I'm glad, you're, I'm glad you're curious. So this, of course, took place in, in Milwaukee, and there was an Italian-populated region of that city called the Third Ward. The St. Anne's Church was a, an Italian evangelical church across from the mission house located next door. So a 10 or 11-year-old daughter of the church cleaning lady discovered this on Saturday morning. The cleaning lady did nothing about it for hours until the arrival of a lady named Maud Richter, who was the assistant to Reverend August Giuliani. I don't know if there's any relation. <laughs> who was out of town at the time. So the cleaning lady, cleaning lady's daughter... The assistant to the reverend, who are there, and the reverend who is out of town. Now, Maud Richter believed it was a suspicious package and could potentially be a bomb. So she called the police around 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and asked for somebody to come immediately. What would make her think of that? Did they have that trouble in the past? I guess so. I guess... Because it's not like today, you know how everyone's like paranoid because of our past? Mm -hmm. It's just... I I'm, wonder if something happened. Well, I can assume because it was paper wrapped and because it probably didn't have a uh, address on it or a stamp. Or return address. Yeah, it was just a mm -hmm. suspicious looking package. It was there sealed by itself and suspiciously on the steps of a church. And Italians were discriminated at that time. For sure. Discriminated against, I should say. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
Of course, they're, they're a huge minority、mm-hmm. in many parts of the United States. So she called the police around five or six and asked for somebody to come over immediately. After an hour went by and no police showed up, she became very concerned and decided to take it downstairs to the basement. <laughs> This package was pretty heavy, weighing about 20 to 40 pounds. And so I have to assume that Maud Richter was not very strong because as she is dragging the potential bomb down the stairs, she is letting it bang on every step along the way.、She's、is she it, really? Yeah.、Oh、so it's going boom, boom, boom on every step. <laughs> she's got a, a potential bomb. She thinks it's a bomb. And she's letting it. She's dragging it down the stairs because it's too heavy to pick up. Jesus. So that's,、uh, yeah, don't do that.、Uh, so she later told the reporter, I imagined, this is quote unquote, I imagined it was some sort of an instrument to harm us. So I called the police headquarters. She said this since there had been bombings in the third ward before. Oh, okay. All right. So, because of that, she was suspicious of kidnapping. Yeah, okay. So, the bomb was most likely targeted for Reverend August Giuliani, which makes lots of sense, right? Who was a Methodist minister and a former Catholic priest, right? Keywords there. Who emigrated to Milwaukee from Italy after meeting and falling in love with an American Protestant missionary named. Catherine Eyrick in Rome. The couple married in 1911 in Milwaukee, where Catherine Eyrick was doing her missionary work. Giuliani embraced his Protestant evangelism and even marched into the Catholic Italian Milwaukee neighborhoods and delivered his Protestant message from street corners, sometimes with music. Oh, so it's the Catholic Protestant thing again. Yep. I'm pretty sure the Catholics didn't like that. Nope. They usually don't. They usually don't. So now he became a street preacher. And he also preached very pro American and patriotic messages and offered English language classes as well as some assimilation assistance. The population in the Third Ward Church grew. So he's growing a following. So he's kind of like you're an Italian Catholic who comes to the United States completely Americanized, converts to being a Protestant, and becomes overly patriotic.、Mm-hmm. So you got some like hardcore Italian Catholics there who. You know, in touch with their roots. Yeah. They probably see this, and he's building a big following. So he was on the street preaching, like the ones on Marbach Road yep. in yep. San Antonio? He's a street preacher.、Okay. And, and I'll, I'll tell you what he was doing to kind of invoke controversy. Well, for people that don't know, Marbach Road in San Antonio, Texas is the worst road in this city. I hate that road. And there's always like preachers, right? On the、yeah. corner, like <clears throat> with a microphone and a speaker. Yeah. Just loudly preaching to the people stopped at the red light. And that, that intersection, 410 and Marbach, is the, has the most accidents than anywhere else in San Antonio. <gasps> it's, it's so awful. Marbach and San Antonio are a huge joke. There's many memes and everything about that street. <laughs> There's something about it. I live there. You live there.、Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a very weird and unique place. There's even a haircut that's unique to that area. <laughs> Which haircut is that? The Floyd Christmas haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do a whole, ep- whole episode on the history of Marbach one day. <laughs> okay. As a bonus episode. I'm sorry, what were you saying? Go、um, on. What was I saying?、Um, so it seems like most of the evidence points towards Giuliani as the main target, from what I've gathered.、Mm-hmm. I don't know how Italians feel about a Catholic priest becoming a minister. Well, they eventually assimilated because they weren't considered white people. In America. Okay. But now they are considered that. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. There's a, you know, last time, last episode, I talked about, I was talking about Caucasians、mm-hmm. and how they're not really necessarily white. They're actually like the white people from that region, the Caucasus region, not really white people altogether.、Mm-hmm. So growing up in England, everyone who looked like me and Chris Martin and Tim Roth, we were <laughs> white. And if you look like someone like, say, Gavin Rossdale, who's like darker complected, dark eyes, dark hair, Mm-hmm. You're not really white. You're something else, but you're not white. He's not blonde hair, blue eyes. Yes. Okay. So even in, in England, there's like there's white people, there's gingers, and then there's everyone else.、Mm-hmm. And that was it. Even the gingers weren't white. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all perspective, really. And how Jewish people were not white, and now suddenly they are white, which is weird to me because it's just it, it's changing. Yeah. It's What about、strange. Syrians? Syrians are like blue eyes, light skin, blonde hair. Jew, you know,、mm-hmm. are they they're, they're from the Middle East? There's so much. I mean, the whole race thing is silly anyway. Yeah, it, it really is. But、um, according yeah, to what you're saying, Italians weren't considered white back then. So, in that evening, a member of the church 
Sam Mazone, along with an unnamed man, brought the package to the police station, which is about six blocks away. Mm-hmm. So none of the police showed up. They've got the bomb in the basement or a potential bomb in the basement. Police aren't showing up. So Sam Mazone, who is a member of the church, who I'll talk about more later, Maud Richter decided, hey, can you go and take us to the police station? Because they're not coming over here. So they arrived at the police station at 725 and Sam put the package on the floor next to the front desk of Sergeant Henry Deckert and said, this is a bomb. I found it under the church. And then, <laughs> okay. and then he was taken down the hall into another room. And most of the people living in the third ward speak Italian as their first language. So the sergeant dragged him to another room for interpreting to figure out what he was saying. Mm-hmm. Because most of these people in the third ward only speak Italian. Okay. They don't speak English. So they, they take him to the other room to figure out what he's saying. And then Sergeant Deckard took the bomb into the office of Lieutenant Robert Flood, lifted the bomb upwards towards him and says, look, this is quote, <laughs> look at this new kind of bomb I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Was Showing... he joking? No. Okay. <laughs> he opened it up, saw it was a bomb and says to the lieutenant who's in charge of the whole place, look at this new type of bomb I've got. <laughs> like, it's a fucking... That's weird. Like, it's such he, a weird response. He's showing it off. Like, look, I've got a new type of bomb. I haven't seen this one before. This <laughs> one's very sophisticated. So Lieutenant Flood, who, of course, was in charge of the station, he says, get that thing out of here. Don't fool around with anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so at this point, Sergeant Decker is thinking, well, where do I take it? Who is it, who's going to man the front desk? You know, nobody told him how to dispose of a bomb. Oh, oh my goodness. You know, there's no training. Like, oh, if you get a bomb in the police station, here's how you dispose of it. Uh-huh. So he didn't know what to do with it. So he just got a bomb in a police station. So he decided to go across the hall to the south side of the station and put it in the assembly room, which had windows to the street. So it was like at the, the side of the building. Mm-hmm. And like I said before, the bomb was described to weigh about 20, 40 pounds based on Marge Richter and Sam Mazzoni's description. So somebody mentioned that the bomb itself was about the size of a half gallon sized jar. So I assume like those little jars with a little little handle on it, the <laughs> spout, something with, like that. With the XXX on there? Yeah, like a poison <laughs> jar. And it had a small bottle on top filled with an unknown, unknown brown liquid. <laughs> and the bottle was attached to some sort of paper and there were thick metal plates on the top and bottom connected with long metal screws Mm -hmm. so he said that he put the um brown bottle of liquid he took it out right oh my god he put the bottle of liquid in his pocket his coat pocket and over a course of a few days it burned a hole in it so it was most likely sulfuric acid oh wow so he, he just takes it like, oh, cool, a little bottle of unknown brown liquid. And he put that in my pocket and leave it there for a few days. <laughs> so around this time, a civilian woman named Catherine Walker shows up at the station to complain about an ex-boyfriend. And then she saw an officer she knew from back in the day, like in high school, and quickly avoided him because she was embarrassed and she was there to complain about a ex-boyfriend. And she's unmarried and didn't want the officer to know about her drama. So mm-hmm. when she saw him, she tried to hide. She hid into the assembly room to avoid the officer until he was out of sight. Just a little tidbit there of why she was in that room. Okay. I was wondering why you were in Yeah, yeah. This. So she, she ends up in that room. Lieutenant Flood at this time goes to his back office. And this is all about five minutes after Samazoni shows up at the station. So all this is about five minutes. Mm-hmm. At this time, 7.33 p.m., the bright flash and loud boom went off blowing out every window of the station's south side and rattled the entire building. All the power was blown out and it was pitch dark in the building. This also damages surrounding buildings and the boom could be felt throughout the whole neighborhood. The Milwaukee Journal described the assembly room as quote-unquote glass, plastering, clothing, arms, legs, and papers covered the floor. Oh, wow. A cap from the officer's head hung on a broken bit of glass on the side window. Through the gaping windows, a faint light of a street light flickered on the scene. From the ceiling swung loosened planks and two blackened chandeliers. That's how it was described in the Milwaukee Journal. The headline on the front page the next day of the Milwaukee Sentinel says, quote unquote, Anarchists bomb explodes in police station. 
kills 11. Now, I mentioned earlier how I killed 10. Mm-hmm. Now, this headline saying killed 11. I'll explain that. I won't get into all the uh, police officers' names because it's going to just take a long time. Uh, but it's a lot to keep up with as it is, so I'll just say that there were nine police officers and one civilian named Catherine Walker who were all killed. The blast was so powerful, it blew off a detective's wedding ring and it was found in the debris or debris. How do you pronounce? I say debris. I say debris. Why? Because I also say Debra, not Debra. I say Debra. Debra. <laughs> Deborah. Debra. Debris. The hyphens between the B and the R. It's just a cultural thing or a regional thing, I guess. Okay. Debris, debris sounds like a rapper's name. <laughs> like MC Debris. <laughs> Go on. Anyway, so his ring was found in the debris, debris, twisted and broken, and it was identified to be one of the police officers because it had his initials on it. Four of the people got out of the building, one of them being Catherine Walker, but none of them survived. So they're able to stagger, they've been blown up. They're but, able to stagger, yeah. but they made it Their into injuries. the ambulance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they died before they got to the hospital. An alarm operator was working on a switchboard on the second floor and was killed at his desk when a piece of shrapnel blasted through the floor, entered him at his waist between the seat arm and seat of the chair, and then exiting out of his head. So it was like a bullet that went through his, his waist, came out of his head. Oh my goodness. Sergeant Deckard, who was holding the bomb between his legs at the time. Oh my god. Because he, he was so curious about it. He's, he's, he's the same guy like, hey, that, look at this new bomb I got. The one that put the brown liquid in his jacket? I believe that was someone else. Oh, okay. I believe there's another officer that, that took it. It could have been him. I have to go back and listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what I said. <laughs> so yeah, Sergeant Deckard, the one who's really enthusiastic about the bomb, he was holding it between his legs. Why? Because he wanted to hold it still while he was moving the piece of paper. Well, anyway, he was literally blown to pieces. He was in so many pieces, so many tiny pieces, that the rescuers assumed an 11th person had died. Oh, so that's why the headline said that. Yeah. Okay. Because they counted 11 because he was in so many different pieces. One newspaper described Sergeant Deckard's remains as teaspoon-sized. Oh my goodness, really? And the only thing that remained of him was... One leg in his uniform trousers that was unrecognizable. So everything else except for his leg blew up to tiny pieces. He was holding the bomb between his legs, his between his knees, to hold the box still while he removed a piece of paper. That is insane. Why are you playing with bombs when you have no training? He's just, he's very happy about this bomb. That is crazy. I don't know what to say. Yeah, and he's like showing everyone. <laughs> 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 Look what I've got. <laughs> I'm going to take it apart. <laughs> oh my god. So he has no training and he was taking apart a the bomb. bomb. Yeah. He was like, well, if I take this piece of paper out, it won't go off. And that's when it blew up. Oh, wow. So a man named Ralph S. McPherson, who was a chief chemist at Alice Chambers, which is kind of like CSI. He later described that the vial in the bomb held sulfuric acid, which dripped onto a zinc plate. And then when the plate gets heated, it would eventually ignite the gun cotton or black powder. And the dynamite was also packed with screws, bolts, tacks, and metal slugs to make it more lethal. So this was dynamite with all these bolts and tacks and pieces of metal put in there for shrapnel in the dynamite. Yeah, that's what they do with the pressure cooker bombs. Yeah. They They put all of that in there. So a Chicago detective who studied the bomb said that the dripping acid acted as a time control as perfect as clock mechanism and was set to detonate around 8 a.m. the next Sunday morning during church service. So, we can only assume it was intended for Giuliani. Yeah. Who was or... out of town. And he's he probably going to be due back at that time to have church service. So, as people are entering the church, that's when the bomb goes off. But would an Italian want to murder other Italians just it, to get to him? Um, I'll explain what he did. Okay. And why I think it was intended for oh, Giuliani. Okay, but... Um... All I've told you is that he converted. But we didn't say... I didn't tell you the details yet. Okay, but the church, I guess they were there wouldn't be Italians there, right? Or would there? They're, they're all Italians. So these are Italian pro- oh, Protestant oh, okay, Methodists. Okay, okay, all right. Who have also converted. Okay, so he, yeah. That's so what I'm saying. He's, he's converting these people. A Catholic, I guess, wouldn't have a problem with that? I don't know. Yeah. So now the question is, who made the bomb? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to Tarantino this a little bit and talk about the event which happened a couple of months before this. So now I'm going to give you the backstory. Okay. So I mentioned earlier how Reverend August Giuliani would kind of flaunt his new religion and his new patriotism in the streets to 
try and convert Italian Catholics into Protestants, right?、Mm -hmm. So, well, there is a neighborhood a couple of miles from this church called Bayview, which housed about roughly 150 Italian families. Many of them only spoke Italian. They felt discriminated against, saw capitalism as corrupt, and did not trust the government at all. So, little anarchy groups were formed, and other people living there sympathized with them because they backed them up because the government mistreated them.、Mm -hmm. And so it was like it's us against them. They don't trust the government.、Mm -hmm. They 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 have their own language, their own culture, everything. So in late August, Reverend Giuliani, his name's August as well, so don't get that confused. But in the month August, in late August, the late August, Reverend Giuliani went into the neighborhood, being a street preacher, trying to convert Catholics, and doing it what was looked like in a very disrespectful way. He did it for three consecutive Sundays, and on the third Sunday, the ninth of September, nineteen seventeen, Giuliani was evangelizing. Doing what street preachers do, and his assistant Maud Richter, the one who dragged the bomb down the stairs, played the accordion. While Sam Mazzoni, the guy who brought the bomb to the police station, played the cornet. Cornet's kind of like a trumpet, slightly different.、Mm -hmm. A few police officers and detectives were also there at Giuliani's request, since the previous two visits to that neighborhood didn't go so well. There was a meeting going on in the saloon down the street of a group of Italian men. And when they heard that Giuliani returned, they all went out to confront him. It was like Giuliani was getting them all worked up on purpose because he knew that he sparked outrage the first two times,、mm -hmm. and so this time he came back with protection to egg them on. You know, he's got co cops and detectives with him now, so now he's like, "Well, I'm protected now. What are you going to do?" Because they were probably trying to be violent towards him and telling、yeah. him to fuck off, and he wouldn't listen.、Mm -hmm. You know, you know how those annoying street preachers are. <laughs> yeah. You just want to like say fuck off. I'm trying to go to work. Leave me alone. Sh stop shouting at me. <laughs> so he was doing that to them in their neighborhood, and he, this is all Catholic people, right? Trying to convert them. So most people felt that it was an intentional power play from Giuliani on that third visit, because he knew what he was doing, and then he came back with cops. Yeah. So when a group of Italian men traveled north to where Giuliani was set up, there was a melee that occurred. What's uh? What's that? It's like a little um. Little fight, little fist fight. Oh, okay,、yeah. all right. Little yeah. push, and yeah,、shove. yeah. A little. Come at me, little, bro. Yeah, exactly. So they were shouting and fighting, and then shots were fired. Two Bayview Italians were killed, and two officers had minor injuries.、Mm. So there was a shootout.、Yeah. It escalated during this exact time, this third time. So he brought cops. Like, well, we've got guns. What are you going to do about it? You know. <laughs> so it escalated to that. He could have just stayed home after that second Sunday. And you were like, "This is too dangerous. Let's not do this." But he wanted to push it further. Yeah, he got his feelings hurt. I think. <laughs> so a Bayview historian named Anna Passante wrote, "Quote unquote." By the second time, he should have understood it was a volatile situation. He should have just backed off, just like I said. Yeah.、Um, the authorities canvassed Bayview and rounded up and arrested eleven Italians for the roles they played in the riot. Accused of assault and intent of murder, they would have been charged up to thirty years if convicted. Wow! So because of that riot, those eleven were rounded up and taken to jail.、Mm -hmm. So they were set up for trial on November twenty eighth, which would have been four days after the bombing. So they're in jail. It wasn't those people, right?、Mm -hmm. So we know that. So now back to finding out who committed the bombing. Fifty officers were assigned to find out who did it in the next three days. They arrested forty four people. But the crime was never solved. They interrogated all the potential suspects, and the city and the county jails were overcrowded with prisoners, and the police had nothing. All the suspects were believed to be Italian, especially the eleven Italian anarchists who were already arrested, known as the Bayview Eleven, who consisted of ten men and one woman named Maria Nardini, who was accused of being the ringleader.、Mm. It's a bit of a、uh, Peaky Blinders. Uh huh. That's what、oh, I think、yeah. of, right?、Mm -hmm. Like you get a little posse, a little gang, and then you got the woman tells them what to do. <laughs> anyway, so the trial of Bayview Eleven began on the thirtieth of November, just six days after the bombing, before Judge August Bacchus. His name's August as well. <laughs> a lot of Augusts here. So Judge Bacchus didn't really back them. That's a play on words. Oh, okay. His name is literally B A C K U S <sighs> Bacchus. <get> <laughs> So Giuliani, the man who was supposedly the main target, was the Italian interpreter for both defendants and the documents. Oh, that's a bunch of malarkey. That shouldn't happen. <laughs> But it did. 
So he's <laughs> he's working on this trial. He could say anything. Yeah. He's translating. <laughs> no, that is BS. That's why it's such a weird a story. A conflict of interest. Yeah. So all of the Bayview 11 were already jailed during the time of the bombing, like I said. And so all knew it wasn't any of them that built or planted the bomb. But because they were anarchists and there were no suspects, the trial held them responsible. Oh, no. Because they, you know how they are, they have to pin somebody. Yep. And they can't look incompetent. Mm. So they like it's like the um was it the Harlem Five or something or am I getting it wrong? The Central Park Five. Central Park Five. There's a Harlem Eight or something or Harlem. <laughs> okay. There's there's many New York uh, mistrials. Mm. But yeah, like, the one you mentioned, the Central Park Five, a lot like that one where they just found five people, they got to convict him and then just put it on them. They did the same thing here with the Bayview Eleven. Mm-hmm. So to what degree the 11 defendants individually participated in the September 9th melee was never really solved. They were probably just bystanders, right? There were other anarchists that were there too that just weren't arrested. And they may have welcomed the riot, but they were all lumped together and accused of the same thing, same charge. So none of they couldn't prove anything for each individual one. They just knew they were all there during the time of that scuffle. So the jury was out in 17 minutes. The verdict against all 11 defendants guilty of assault to commit murder. Judge Backus, quote unquote, said this. All of you are aliens in this country but a few years. You have cast aside all American institutions which have offered you advancement. Your purposes are destructive and ruinous and the court must measure out such punishment as consumer of a head with a crime which all of you have committed. <laughs> Milwaukee isn't in the south. I know. I, <laughs> I couldn't do a uh, Italian American accent. Who would uh, this just sound like a southern? Hey. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what Judge Bacchus was. He Maximus. Italian? Bacchus it sounds no. kind of Roman. Um, you watch Monty Python? Mm, Julius yeah. getting interference on Halloween. It doesn't sound Italian to me, but I don't know. I'm not good with. Last names or surnames on where they come from. I think I mentioned his name was August Bacchus, right? Yeah. August seems like to be an Italian name. And Augustus? No, just August. No? Okay. Maybe they Americanized it. Maybe his name was something. But Bacchus sounds very ancient Rome. I don't know. I'm not good with... Maximus something us Bacchus? <laughs> I guess. It sounds like gladiators to me. Bacchus. Anyway... He sentenced all of them to 11 to 25 years in prison. Now, for your favorite part, the conspiracies. Ooh. What do you think could have happened, Marissa? Okay. I think the priest did it to himself because he wasn't there. And he wanted to make them look bad. The um, anarchists, the Italian Catholics. I really thought you were going to say that. Really? And I thought a similar thing. If you want to make them look bad and maybe even kill a few people in your church. Yeah, and then you get sympathy. Yes, and then more church members. Mm. And and probably, yeah, symphony. And then... Hey, so, symphony. Sim sympathy and then, hey, help me rebuild my church. Or, I need um, money. Or Italian Catholics will be like, well, I don't want to be associated with that. Like, I guess I'll, you know, become Protestant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was thinking. And he wasn't there. That's a suspicious part to me. Yeah. And then, like, they're like, it's a bomb. Yeah, and, and the people who were arrested, they didn't do anything like that. They, there were shots fired because there were shots fired, you know. And anti-capitalists are always painted as um, violent people. Yeah. For reasons like this, you know, so you, they're, they're viewed in a negative way mm -hmm. compared to others, you know, other yeah. groups. So I don't know. Yeah. I think it was the priest who did it himself. I, I thought the very same thing. And then he got involved in the trial. Yeah. And then like, how do you know that what, what he, what he's translating is actually what they're saying? Yeah. So he pretty much had this under control. Like, mm -hmm. And he was on the good side of the policeman. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he had the cops on his side, taking him there with him and stuff. And they're Protestants themselves, you know, and, and, you know, they'll, they'll, he's one of the good Italians yeah. they're probably viewed as. Yeah. And he's very American, very yeah. patriotic. And, mm -hmm. and then he leaves town in the time that the bomb is there, like bombs planted. He leaves. He's gone out of town and then he come, he's supposed to come back Sunday, but it blows up before then. Maybe he's waiting for it to blow up. Yeah. And then he comes back like, like oh, oh, what, what happened? happened? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm out of town one weekend. <laughs> and it all goes to shit. Yeah. 
So that's why I was thinking. But did he want it to blow up in the police station or in his church? I I don't. I think it was meant to blow up the church. Yeah. It was not meant to go to the police station. It was six blocks away. Oh yeah, that's right. I don't know why I'm thinking it was next door. No, there was a uh, I think a missionary house next door where they did something else, maybe like a school, Sunday school or something like that. I have no idea. But yeah, I was thinking it could be uh, Reverend Giuliani had somebody plant the bomb while he's out of town, maybe. Paid somebody because some, he's got a little bit of money. And then blame it on the Catholic Italian anarchists, which so happens to be the CIA. Those Giulianis are always <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> yeah, get it? CIA, Catholic Italian anarchists. And receive a lot of sympathy and all that, like we mentioned. <laughs> I and, just got it. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, claim insurance for the church if you had church insurance. Do you have church insurance in 1917? I have no idea, but you get sympathy donations. Yep. And you're like, yeah, look at these people that have been arrested. The 11 Bayview 11 have been arrested. They're bad people. I'm a good person. And they bombed my church while I was gone. And he could have killed some of his own people, even his assistant. That's psychotic. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, your, your personal assistant, Marge Richter, she could have died dragging a bomb down the stairs <laughs> that you planted. Letting it... Hit each stair going down. Yeah, yeah. And imagine those big concrete stairs called... Anyway, I only could imagine what it looked like. But yeah, that's how it was described. And um, what's his name? The other guy, Sam, he had to carry it out of the basement and to the police station six blocks, carrying a 40-pound bomb before wheelbarrows were invented. Yeah, he seems like he got beat up because uh, then he went back to instigate more fights and he went with the police and he probably like thought up this whole plan and like, I'm going to get them back. And- yeah. I thought you would like this one. Yeah. It's a fun, fun little story. I love conspiracies. Yeah. And, and still to this day, it's never been solved of who made the bomb. It's still an unsolved mystery. I think they would have talked like, especially if it was that community, the Catholic Italian community. Yeah. I think somebody would have talked like eventually. Exactly. They could be bragging about it. Yeah. That's why I think it was. Oh, but then we don't know if they talked because he, no, he would have translated that. If it was actually somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. It was I, him. I think it was him. <laughs> <laughs> it was my first conspiracy episode. Ooh. First mystery episode. Wait until we get to 1947 when the CIA is created. Oh, yeah. The Catholic Italian anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> what else happened in 1917? On January 19th, 1917, a blast at the munitions factory in London, kills 73 and injures over 400. The resulting fire causes 2 million pounds worth of damage in the Silverton explosion. On January 16th, the quote-unquote Zimmerman telegram is sent from Germany to Mexico, stating in the event of the U.S. entering World War I, on the Allied side, Mexico would be given Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. Intercepted by British intelligence and partially deciphered by the next day, its release in March shifts U.S. public opinion in favor of war against Germany. On April 10th, an ammunition factory explodes in Chester, Pennsylvania, kills 133 people. On February 13th, Dutch exotic dancer Mata Hari. Mata Hari? Am I saying that correctly? I don't know. She's arrested in Paris on suspicion that she is a German spy. Got one more explosion for you. Gonna end with a bang. On December 6th, Halifax explosion. Two freighters collide in the Halifax Harbor at Halifax, Nova Scotia, and cause a huge explosion that kills at least 1,963 people, injures 9,000, and destroys part of the city. The biggest man made explosion in recorded history until the Trinity nuclear test in 1945. Whoa. We could do an episode on that, but that's, that's huge, literally. On December 20th, 1917, Enrique Esparza dies at the age of 89. He is the last eyewitness to the Battle of the Alamo. At age eight, Enrique witnessed one of the bloodiest battles in history. His father, Gregorio Esparza, was killed in the fighting on that day on March 6th. On March 6th, 1836, Enrique died in San Antonio, Texas of natural causes. Wow. And he is... My fifth generational uncle. His you're, you're, father is my sixth generational. You're a real American. <laughs> I'm a real Texan. Yep. Uh, his father, Gregorio Sparza, his brother is my grandfather. My sixth generational, generational grandfather. And he fought on the side of Mexico while Gregorio fought for the side of the Alamo. Very cool. 
It's a bonus episode. And my eighth generational grandfather died of diarrhea at the age of 80 in the San, Fer- San Fernando Cathedral downtown in San Antonio. Whoa. Yeah. I, I think that's how I'm going to die. <laughs> I thought about all the ways I can die. And that's the most realistic. Dying of diarrhea. But I am a proper Texan. Yeah. You were here before the white people. Exactly. Before the white people try to take over and claim it as theirs. That's well, a whole nother episode. Well, that's all the things that happened in 1917. We'll see you in 1918. Have a happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.